For overlanders seeking remote and hard to access places, I do not regard South Africa as being high on the list when compared with other African countries. It's comparatively well developed. But for adventure travelers, it surely is one of the best. I lived in South Africa for 42 years and during that time there were few parts of the country that I didn't visit. This is part two as I take you to see some of these places with unseen footage and untold stories. Early 2010, I went to Natal to retrace the very first four-wheel drive track that I ever drove in my own vehicle. That was back in 1983. This is Cape Vidal. This is the first stop on our little adventure. What we're going to do is we're going to explore the marine sanctuaries in the area, which includes St. Lucia, right up to Cozy Bay on the Mozambique border. This is the Indian Ocean. And as usual, it's like warm soup. The most rewarding part of my job isn't the travel, it's this, toys. This was my very first underwater camera housing. Later that same year, I was introduced to a GoPro. I'm in the far eastern part of South Africa, in a province called KwaZulu-Natal, right up against the Mozambique border. I'm here retracing my steps. You see, in 1982, I bought my very first 4x4. It was a Range Rover. And it was here that I took my very first self-drive expedition. I was 22 years old. This little bit of the trip has significance for me. When I started doing this four-wheel drive thing, uh, I got my, fir my, own fir my first vehicle of my own in 1982. It was a Range Rover, 10 year, old, 10 year old model. I decided to come to Cozy Bay and in fact I recorded it as my very first expedition in my own vehicle. And I am now returning 35 years later to relive that moment when I first came here. I didn't have the luxury of a boat. I also didn't have the luxury of a guide to show us around Cozy Bay. And that's what we're going to do now. These were the very first pictures I took of it, which I guess led me to a career in taking pictures of 4x4s. And not unlike today, here I am spending my weekend working on it, here laying some carpet and soundproofing. Uh, if I think about it, absolutely nothing has changed. I chose this part of Natal for my first expedition because I could reach it in less than two days and it was still remote and unspoiled. My task now is to find out if that is still the case 27 years later. We're descending now after a 11 hours non-stop driving we're descending the final descent to the sea at Cape Vidal at the campsite here. Every now and again somebody develops something in the camping and four-wheel drive market that gets me very, very excited. And here's another one. And the reason why I'm excited is that every so often I buy a, a new four-wheel drive vehicle and spend lots of time equipping it. I've actually had eight. This particular piece of equipment is getting me thinking about doing another one. 
The essence of simplicity. Watch this. No, I don't actually, Clearly I'm finished. <laughs> that, this is what surely must be the simplest test of tent in the world. Now the thing is, the whole idea behind this is for two people and two people only. Driving in the vehicle that is completely and utterly equipped. Now the way this works is, underneath the mattress, in this portion here, is where you put all your clothes and things inside here. And then once they're in packed properly, of course this will be flush and I'm going to go to sleep. Ta-da! Hey, how about that? It's not my car. I have absolutely no idea what they left for me here. Gas tank inside there. And a little stove with a little wind brake. The idea behind this is that it is a self-contained safari vehicle fully equipped for two people. This piece in the back actually six bolts and out it comes and what you're left with is normally pick up. Put it in and it's a safari vehicle. This is the prototype and I'm testing it and I found a few niggles so far but they're little. I think the concept is brilliant. African Outback Products has since gone out of business. This very promising idea never took off. So I'm now going to show you what we're doing here and where we're going to be going. Last night we spent at Cape Vidal. It's right here. We actually returned this morning to the town of St. Lucia and in the boat traveled about eight kilometers up this river here. Later on today we actually have to head back to the main road because we're heading west, uh, east. We're going to end up about here. Sodwana Bay. Sodwana is a very, very touristy area. I was there um, five or six years ago, didn't like it one bit, left, only because it was, there were just too many people and a lot of the people there were diving. There was a lot of, also a lot of irresponsible four-wheel drivers mucking up the beach. I understand that they've sorted that out. We're going to be spending some time at Sodwana and then heading further east. Uh, Rocktail Bay is where we're going to be spending some time. Never been there, don't know anything about it. I understand it's stunning. This area here, we'll be ending our trip at Cozy Bay. This is significant for me. In 1982, I got my first four-wheel drive and the first expedition I put together was to Cozy Bay. And I remember it with fond memories. And this is the first time since then that I've been back. But before we head off, I have two places I want to visit. I'd like to take a boat trip up the river. And I also want to see the crocodile enclosure. The boat leaves from quite close from St. Lucia town, goes up the river about eight kilometers, doesn't go into the main body of the lake because that's actually far too far. But this is the, the river section that actually feeds the lagoon uh, from the sea. And as you can see, a lot of wildlife. This crocodile sanctuary is really beautiful. It's set right in the coastal forest, so the tree canopy is absolutely beautiful. They've done it nicely too. There's a cycad forest. There are areas where there are little crocodiles, so you can get very, very close to them in their little enclosures, a bit like a zoo, but the big guys are in settings that feel and look very natural. This is part of the vast Cozy Bay Tidal Lake system. We're going to look for the freshwater parts that are not unlike the Okavango Delta in Botswana, so I'm told. It's a half hour boat ride. There's a very, very narrow channel we're trying to find that leads onto Lake 2. Proof that men do ask directions. As a last resort, of course. 
It is indeed like the Okavango. That is a huge surprise for me. Sound is a black crack. It's like a channel in the Okavango. Hey? Coming after us. <laughs> These are traditional fish catchers, grass netting erected in a maze so that fish can find their way in but not out. Nets like these line the shores of the cozy lakes and feed hundreds of families living in the area. Catalina Bay, named after a wreck, which is a couple of kilometers that way. But is it a wreck of a ship or a wreck of an aircraft? See, Catalina flying boats, they're large twin engined, like tugboats with wings. And I am suggesting that it's named after these flying boats that used to operate from the waters of Lake St. Lucia. And not only that, that these wooden structures were built to birth them. Now, I've got a theory. How do I find out if this was actually made for the flying boats? I figure if an aircraft is going to sit in here, they're going to want to tie it up to stop it yawing like that. So they have to tie it at the back and the front. But how do they do that with an aeroplane with such long wings? So the distance between that pontoon and that pontoon is not too much wider and certainly not narrower than the wingspan of a Catalina flying boat, then my theory holds up. Okay, that's 28. As it turns out, I was both right and wrong. Completely wrong about the Catalina and these structures. The span being 31 meters and the length being 19 meters bear no resemblance to the structure. But I wasn't wrong about Catalina Bay being named after the Catalina flying boats that once operated on St. Lucia. There were two known fatal crashes on the lake, one of them at Catalina Bay.
This is Sodwana campsite. It's the kind of campsite that makes me want to give up camping. We arrived late at night. The officials at the gate were officious, unfriendly, rude, but let's put that aside. The campsite itself, there's nothing wrong with it. It's very, very big. It's, uh, you know, ablutions are reasonably good. Uh, but the trouble is with it, even on a day like today, in the middle of the week, it's reasonably busy. But before you've woken up in the morning, tractors are whizzing by, people are walking by. It's a very, very commercial environment. So Sadwana is the kind of place that I remember it to be when I first came here. I stayed one night and I got the hell out of here. And that's exactly what I'm doing today. That is after, of course, I've had a little look around. Just putting it in four, putting it in four wheel drive. But this is Sadwana how I remember it. It's not a beach at all, it's a car park, and in the weekends, it's a very big car park. But uh, let's go and have a walk around anyway, check it out. When I first came here, would have been about 1985, I was disgusted by the place. There were literally a hundred vehicles on this beach, and this lagoon over here was flowing out to the sea. There was a Hilux with a man in the front seat, driving seat, holding a bottle of cane spirits and not more than two meters from his wheels was a little girl with a bucket and spade. I was horrified and I left. But today it's actually quite, quite nice. I asked one of the local ski boat operators, what's the deal here with all of the boats and cars? This beach itself is a working beach, classified as a working beach, it's an operator's beach. So there's 100 vehicles allowed okay. with boats on okay. the beach here as such right. in this particular area. Right. On the north beach itself, they also allowed 100 recreational vehicles. Yeah. Those are the average family goers who come down okay. for their families and okay. have a picnic on the beach. It has to be a reason why Sadwana is right here. Is it the reef? A lot of it is because of the, the uh, diverse reef ecology that we got down here. Yeah. With a diverse uh, fish population and stuff. I mean, yeah. we've got over a thousand species of fish. Right. Um, it's always clean water here. Yeah? No real rivers close by. Warm, clean water. Yeah. We see a lot of the whales come past, dolphins, manta rays, whale sharks, all the nice kind of stuff for families to see and do. No sooner had we started filming in the surf that some officials arrived and told us that we couldn't film. The professional looking equipment was the problem. Beach driving in South Africa is not permitted on any beach unless it's a specifically designated beach. So the wrong vehicle on the wrong beach can be confiscated. You know, for all the bureaucracy one has to put up with coming in and out of these areas, the moment you come, you know, you pass through the gate, show them your forms, you realize why it's necessary. Suddenly now, the bush is absolutely beautiful, pristine, untouched. So it's times like these that I kind of forgive them for this mad bureaucracy. I suppose it's there to protect it. And it's, boy, is it worth protecting. What we're doing now, Sodwana is now behind us and we're taking a back road. Difficult to navigate. It's supposed to be very, very sandy. So we're gonna have fun with the trailer and this Hilux. This, I don't have my own equipment with me here. I normally use an ARB easy deflator, uh, which is quick, easy, simple, accurate. Even when empty, that 2.2 litre Hilux struggles in the sand. While the 3 litre, 
makes the climb without difficulty. The distinction really between the two is this, that you have the power to just drag you off the top eventually, essentially. In sand, yeah. cars with more power, yeah. work better. Yeah. Simple as that. Yes. This here, narrow gap, is the entrance to this vast lake system. You would think it would be much bigger considering the volume of water, but actually only a small portion of it is tidal, and the tide is now turned. With the tide coming in fast, people who have been enjoying themselves on one of the many islands must make their way back to the mainland before they're cut off. Rocktail Bay Beach Camp is uh, well renowned for a fa as a family destination. And I asked them why this was the case. Well, facilities in the camp are very, very nice, very nice for children, pool, etc. But there's something else that children particularly love. And we're going to go and find out what that is right now. Snorkeling. Rocktail Bay boasts some of the best snorkeling in all of South Africa. My boys love to snorkel. Combined with Even if time flies away